Good. Okay. We are going to call the Wednesday, November 17, 2021 Board of Education meeting back to order and to regular session. Everyone, please silence your electronic devices and we will stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Additions and deletions to the agenda since Friday mailing. Yes, we'll have two business considerations. 6.8 will be the composite tax collection report. 6.9 will be a change order for a phase three construction for electrical. Uh, personnel considerations, there'll be two added names to 7.6 and we'll be um, hiring a registered nurse. Okay, can I have a motion for the additions and deletions? Mr. Ross, a second. Mrs. Burns, all in favor? All right. Can I have a motion for the acceptance of the minutes of the November 3rd, 2021 BOE meeting? Mrs. Klein, Mr. Ross, all in favor? All right. Our first presentation tonight is going to be a construction update from John Sharkey. Good evening. So I think you all have a copy of the presentation there in front of you. Um, so we were asked by Dr. Bailey to give a quick update on where the construction project is, uh, talk about the status of your building condition survey, and talk about briefly talk about a capital project planning process, you know, what, what a district has to go through in order to do a capital project. So if we turn to the first page, I'll talk about the phase three project, which we're just completing. Um, the, all the work at the high school is 99% done. We have a couple of punch list items that still need to be completed and uh, some commissioning on the uh, HVAC, HVAC systems, the air systems. Uh, we have a third party engineer that comes in and looks at everything to make sure everything's operating the way it should. With the change in weather, it's, it takes a little bit more time because we're going from obviously from a uh, cooling to a heating season. So that'll, that'll uh, go on for another you know, several weeks, but we want to make sure everything's correct. Um, A.W. Becker and Peter B. Uh, pretty much are the same status. Uh, as you probably recall, the, uh, the showers that were supposed to go into the uh, health office areas went from a 12-week delivery because of COVID to a 28-week delivery period, so we wound up switching to a tile shower. Uh, the showers are complete now other than some plumbing uh, fittings that have to go in there, so we should be wrapping that up this week. So, uh, and we'll be doing some commissioning there. Uh, there's a few photos there to show you how things turned out. Um, and then we're uh, pretty much wrapping up the contracts with the, uh, the contractors. So 2020 building condition survey, uh, the results have been submitted to SCD and accepted. So that's that portion of the, of the uh, survey is complete. Um, as part of that, we use that as a tool to go into your five year plan for the district. And right now we're looking at uh, some of the items we spoke about before, ventilation upgrades, paving improvements, uh, handicap accessibility throughout the district. Uh, pool uh, air handler filtration and carbon monoxide detectors. Those are some of the, the higher items we're looking at that uh, we recommend that uh, get put in the uh, priority category. So if you switch to the next page, we've done a building condition uh, district-wide summary by building um, to make things a little bit easier. We took all the information out of the building condition survey, put it into a spreadsheet here of items. So if, for instance, if you look down at the high school, at the bottom line, if you took care of all the issues we found in the building condition survey, uh, you're at roughly $5.6 million for, for renovations there. And, and this is just uh, building condition infrastructure. We haven't sat down with the district yet to talk about educational program or, or um, needs in those areas. If you look in the column all the way to the, all the, way to the uh, right, we, I didn't show the whole thing, but those green columns are where we start to break out. Right now we have it as must do, should do, and nice to do. We start breaking that out by year. So you'll see 2021, 20, 2022. So we'll start meeting with the committees to decide what years the district wants to try to take on those items. So next page would be the middle school, same, same uh, type of information. Uh, if you go all the way to the bottom, it has the totals there uh, for the entire building. And then again, those columns must do, should do, and nice to do. Um, so. A.W. Becker, the same. 
uh, Peter B. Following sheet is the same. Uh, the totals are almost the same. Not surprising because their buildings were both built at the same time. Um, transportation building, uh, not a lot we saw there other than uh, paving at the uh, bus parking areas to help you know uh, maintenance of the buses would be better if it was paved. And then the warehouse, uh, some minor items, ventilation, and a few other things. So if you come to the uh, the summary sheet, district wide, everything we found for all the buildings came out to roughly 12.1 million out of that survey for over the next five years. Um, then you'd have to add in incidental costs so that the district would incur. So if you did everything, it would be roughly around 14.5 million dollars to get your buildings up to satisfactory condition district wide. I mean, the, the buildings are in great condition, but like anything else, you know, work has to get done year to year to keep, keep maintenance. So um, as part of that process, uh, that typically leads into a capital project. So if on the next page, I kind of laid out the initial stages of a capital project, um, assuming, and we, we just did an assumption, assuming a vote sometime in October, November of 2022, a uh, typical process uh, would be that the district would form a representative committee to start talking about projects, not just the building facilities, but also the educational program. Um, in other districts we've had, uh, as part of that committee, it's usually the administration, facility members, architect, teacher representative, and a, and a student representative. So you've got a broad spectrum of people that are involved in that committee, um, and also the community, and, and most importantly, the district financial advisor to keep track of, uh, of the size of the project. Um, we also recommend, and we've done in a lot of school districts, we reached out to each school principal to get their ideas of what they need. Uh, we, we sometimes send out a spreadsheet and say, you know, give a list of your top 10 priorities in each school, you know, and that gives us a good idea of what they're looking for. We don't want to go down the road of doing a project where the administration and the people that run the schools aren't involved. So th there should be a lot of involvement with the, uh, with the administration and, and the school. Um, so the next step is once the committee has a preferred concept, you know, that everybody seems to agree on, we would work up scopes, budget es estimates, and then do a presentation to you folks to, to uh, show you what we've uh, uncovered. And this whole thing usually is about a three to four month process, roughly, depending on how quick you want to, uh, you want to work. Uh, next page then is once you have a project together, uh, then our recommendation is go out to the public and start letting people know what the project potential project is going to be. I showed a couple of samples of what we've done in other districts where we put a board at each school that shows what the scope would, of work would be at each school, the cost, the cost to taxpayers, so that each, uh, each parent at each school would know exactly what's going on at their building. Um, and this information would, could also go on your website, you know, go out to the public and mailers, home with the students. Uh, and, as, and during that process, the, the Board of Ed would also have to uh, undertake a seeker state uh, environmental Quality Review Act on a project to determine, uh, you know, if it's, there's any negative impacts on that, and then uh, also provide a resolution to go to a capital project. And that also is about a three-month process once the committee is done with that work. So the next page, I just did a quick sample schedule. It's just a rough draft. Uh, so if you wanted to, for instance, form a committee next month, uh, we would recommend at least four meetings uh, once a month with that committee, um, just to talk about projects, talk about the wants and needs of the district. Uh, then we would do the presentation to you folks, as I mentioned, sometime around May of next year, and then public information and regulatory, that usually takes, like I said, about three months to go through that process. And that would get you to an October, November vote date. So it, it does take quite a bit of planning to, uh, to go through a project like that. Uh, once the vote is done, if the project proceeds, uh, the design of the drawings and, and the detailing usually takes about eight months, depending on the size of the project. Uh, and then there's the state education department review, which is also about three months process. So in essence, once you start a committee in December, by the time construction starts, you're all the way out to 2024 on a big project. That's how long it takes to really get, you know, anything significant done and make sure you have enough time to involve, you know, the administration, the school and, and the community. So that's for a larger project. There's also the opportunity to do smaller projects, which are uh, called capital outlay projects, uh, which the district can do. And typically these don't exceed $100,000. Um, they're usually a line item in your budget vote every year in May. 
So if you did have some critical things that needed to get done quicker, uh, that process is about three months to go through that because there's not a lot of planning. Everybody can decide pretty quick what they want to do. Uh, so if you put that in your that project in your 2022 line item, you could potentially start uh, construction next year in the summer. Um, so that's that. That'd be the smaller projects, and that is basically a, just a timeline of of how you go through the process. And the first step, as I said, is to uh, if you want to proceed, is to form a committee and find committee members willing to uh, spend a lot of time looking at things. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, John. Some uh, of the items on this list. Um, like must-do items like ventilators in a lot of our schools, yep. which are more than a $100,000 project. Is there anything we can do to try to fast-track this? Because that would be like two and a half more school years before we start this project, right. it being 2024. <laughs> Is there anything we can do for some of these crucial items that are saying must-do that we could possibly get started by even 2023? I know yeah. obviously 2022 is a little quick, but right. some of these items, it seems like an awful long time to wait two and a half years. Yeah. Yeah, no, there, there is, you could do expedited projects. We, we'd have to know pretty quick what they are. I mean, if you, if it's not anything to do in the seeker process, the seeker state of uh, quality review act, if it's a type two action, which means there's no negative impact, that whole process takes about three to four months. So if you, if we were aware of a project that you really knew you wanted to do and get the information out to the public, it could be done much quicker. I mean, this, this original layout was for, you know, a larger, larger capital project. Well, how do items get into a must do list? How so do if they? it's a must do list to me, it, it, yeah. it needs to get done. Right. It, it seems like it would be a priority. Yep. So, so I yeah. mean, I think all items in a must do list two and a half years seems like a long time to me. Right. But I, I just don't know how, is it possible to make it shorter? It, it is possible. We'd have, to, we'd have to sit down. I mean, I'm looking at the worst case scenario for a big project, but if you had some items you wanted to do right away and we could sit down, we could meet next week and talk about, you know, some updated schedules to see, it could definitely be done sooner if you wanted to take, you know, pick off certain items. One of the things that, uh, one of the things we discussed in preparation for the meeting tonight was uh, in this last project, which was just over $30 million, we did um, the largest portion, a smaller portion, and then the smallest portion, which was intended to uh, account for any money that left over from the project uh, contingencies. Um, is um, We discussed the possibility of reversing that process a little bit, just as Teddy's talking about, because it is going to be relevant to when our debt uh, is, rolls off and money becomes available as well. We know that we have money in our capital reserve right now um, that with voter approval can come out, and that could go a long way towards some of these things that are the mu on the must-do list. So we could do a project upside down. In other words, we could do some smaller items in a phase one, and then as uh, our debt rolls off from prior construction, we could go in and do a larger phase two or phase three, um, just the opposite of the way we did it now. It really comes down to um, timelines for proposals, the CICRA, the um, state ed approvals, and then being able to go out uh, to the uh, the public for a vote. So um, in our discussions uh, this past week, we said that um, we thought that there definitely are some smaller items with uh, money that's available to us now that we could address with all the other logistical uh, approval stages we could potentially get to with our May vote, with our budget vote. Um, so we could go out um, with a smaller project then with the plan to do something, uh, go out again in the fall with a larger scale one, which would uh, create more time for planning because it isn't just the conceptualization of it. It also requires a lot of work on John and his folks to be able to um, uh, estimate the scope of work, the cost, uh, what the, the forecast might be for uh, the uh, ability to get uh, vendors and things like that. So I think that we will be able to, to accomplish both things and get to some of the higher need items um, sooner. Absolutely. Yep. I'm sorry, Dr. Bell, did you say this budget season for some of these things? We'll be able to do um, some of the smaller scale things right. in right. this May budget vote okay. and potentially accessing some of our money from our capital reserve for that. Um, is there anything else, John? No, um, I think part of the process is 
and then we'll go through this list, we'll put it on a much bigger spreadsheet, and we'll identify columns. What can be targeted right now through either a capital outlay, as John spoke to, yeah. which will be part of the line item budget, or if there's any items, I know Teddy talked about the last time we met, what can we do that we can get through the process soon enough so that at the May vote, we can talk about what can be done. Um, part of the committee will be to have um, our financial advisor come in and tell us what can, how much we right now we have $4.8 million in the capital reserve. How can that uh, offset the cost of the taxpayer? So that'll be all part of the next conversation. How much would we need if we wanted to do the air handling units? Um, we have to look at every project that we look at. How much of it is aidable? To what extent is it aidable? And that also has happens when they look at each project. If is there is there an instructional component because that's an aid generator? If it's a reconstruction of reconstruction of instructional spaces is an aid generator. And then how do we use that capital reserve to offset what the aid won't cover? So our taxpayers have little to no um, responsibility in the in the cost of it. And so our, those are things that the committee will do. And our aid ratio at this time. Is Hello. Our aid ratio at this time is about 70%. Yep, 69.6%. Yeah. So uh, our dollar goes quite a long way. And yep. about $5 million in the capital reserve right now? Correct, 4.8. Yeah. 4.8. And um, there is, uh, we have up to $2 million more we can place in there. Correct. And remember, uh, it's only with voter approval that the money can come back uh, out of that fund correct. once we put it in there. Right. Yep. Sure. Anybody else have any questions? No? Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right, thank you. Okay, we have no hearings and petitions in this agenda items. Uh, I need a motion for one or all of the business considerations. I make a motion for all six one to six nine. Okay. Do I have a second? Mr. McFerrin, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion's passed. A motion for one or all of the personnel considerations. Make a motion for all, 7 1 to 7 21. Okay. Do we have a second? Mr. McFerrin, I would like to read uh, 7 11. The Board of Education approves the retirement with regret of Laura Buzas, our principal of the middle school. So we just want to thank her for her time at RCS. Anybody else have anything else? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion's passed. Uh, eight is informational items only. Special reports. A couple of things I would like to report on is, one, our district negotiating team had an opportunity to meet with the teachers unit last night. We had a productive meeting and we are optimistic about coming to an amicable agreement in future meetings so I really appreciate the time of uh, both group uh, teams last night and uh, look forward to our next meeting uh, the other thing I do want to bring up and congratulate the um, football team for their sectional title on Sunday uh, it is their first football sectional title since I believe 2004 and I think they play on Friday night at CBA, I believe at 7 o'clock for a regional football playoff game. Anybody else have anything else to report? No? Okay. I will turn it over to Dr. Bailey. Um, at the last meeting, we had a quick discussion about public events and the public event calendar that's out right now. We have, um, and we figured we would discuss them in like two month chunks, that's relevant. So we may not be able to actually um, have a meaningful discussion about graduation because we don't really know where we'll be at graduation at this point. But we know uh, between now and, and January, we have school concerts, uh, we have award ceremonies, we have sporting events. Um, and um, uh, our expectation and what we've done so far is we've tried to uh, keep capacity down to about 50% in the auditorium. That allows people who are in attendance to spread out a little bit um, from other families. And as of right now, we've managed to keep our students away from the audience because um, in, in, uh, while they're in school, we're trying to continue to maintain the practices that we're doing on a daily basis. So as a, for instance, um, we held the high school concert here. That was before our last board meeting. 
we'll be holding um, some other uh, elementary and middle school concerts before we get to December 30th. And we'll, we're letting families know, uh, based on the number of students involved, how many family members they can bring. Our concerts are being recorded and they're being placed in the children's Google Classrooms. So if there are family members who can't attend, they'll be able to watch it afterward. We're not able to broadcast because of copyright reasons. That's why we're not live broadcasting our concerts. However, our um, recognition programs, we had the middle school one um, last week, I believe, two weeks ago, excuse me, and uh, Becker's will be this Thursday. We are live broadcasting them uh, on the same link that we use for board meetings. So if family members can't attend for some reason, um, they're able to view that um, at home and review it, I suppose, because it'll go, it's saved on our website. Dr. Bill, just one quick question. What's the difference of live streaming and then posting it in Google Classroom? Um, Why does the copyright stop when it's posted in Because Google it's Classroom? in the Google Classroom for the child's educational purpose. Yeah. There's no way to live stream it, not through YouTube? No, uh, it would, there would be a copyright issue with each of the, um, the people who publish the music. The no, I get that. No, I, I, totally, yeah. I totally understand that. Yeah. So this is, this, is going to be, this is going to be a major discussion in, in my house this evening. Um, <laughs> so there's, okay, all right, well, that's, I have some ideas, but because we have a concert coming up that I don't think I got invited to. Oh. But I want to see it right. So we'll see. All right. Thank you. For, um, for some instance, some of the elementary concerts coming up, um, something like the fifth grade concert is uh, in each of the buildings is, is small. There's uh, 60 to 70 students, so we can have four family members attend. But something right. large scale like second and fourth grade combined, twice as many students, it limits it to only two family members per, right. per student. So oh, right. wait, I remember. Because we did this in AP, where the only way to access the concert was through like a specific address. It was through private. a classroom link, yeah. Did something like that won't work? Um, not I, I don't want to take up time. I mean, yeah, I'll, not, I'll, not I'll shoot you ideas, but all right. Yeah, thanks. Um, award ceremonies, uh, we've been able to uh, have uh, four or five family members of each of them. And um, as I mentioned, the Becker one is this week, and uh, I think they they had five, five or six family members who were able to attend that, and that is live streamed. Um, sporting events are happening as, as normal uh, in the buildings. Um, there was one more thing. One more thing? Oh, uh, the parent conferences. Um, we're giving families the option to do family uh, parent conferences in person or uh, virtually. I think, in all honesty, we found attendance to be a little bit higher when we were forced to do all virtual last year because people were able to do it from work or from home with their small children there. It was a little bit helpful to them. So we're very fortunate to be able to offer both options. And I don't know, to, to the first one is the 30th, I believe, half day for the elementary and middle school. Um, I don't know what the return is right now uh, as far as how many people have chosen in person or remotely. but. Um, it is nice to be able to offer both options. Um, and I do think that's the extent of our public events between now and, uh, and January 1. Does anybody have any questions about them? Um, the board has uh, policies in place that we actually had revisited uh, not that long ago. Uh, since I've been here, maybe 2000, 14 or 15, we re-examined our field trip policies to ensure that they were in compliance with what would be legally, you know, fiduciary responsibility uh, as far as the district uh, goes. And in the past, we've had relationships with EF Tours before. That's a, you know, it's a nationally renowned company. Um, and I just happened to be speaking with, uh, with a representative from the company. They currently work in Boysville, Catskill, Bethlehem, and Gilderland. And, uh, and, and I live in one of those districts and worked in one of those districts and, and know the work that they do. It's an opportunity for our students to uh, experience what they've learned or things they haven't learned in a very different way. But I wanted you to know that, um, you know, I think it'd be beneficial for our school community to have students to have opportunities like this. This is a company that takes their responsibility very seriously about student safety and staff safety. Uh, and, and I hit them really hard in those discussions too about that because we, you know, we, we worry about our kids going to the mall now. 
So, um, and, and they said like, as of for instance right now, they're only traveling to countries where they know that everyone that's there is absolutely safe, both from COVID and from you know, the world, uh, violence in the world and things like that. But um, I wanted to you know, ask the board what questions they might have about those types of trips. The soonest trip they would be discussing would be 2023. So it's no one would be going to spring. They would instead be, we'd have discussions with students who are age eligible and um, they wouldn't be going until the spring of next year. And they traditionally go over a break. They go over April break or February break. So they're missing little or no school as a component of it. Um, but I was wondering if, if you had any questions about that or concerns about us. Usually those are led by a faculty member, right? That's correct. So. I don't, I'm not sure what we're looking for here. Did we at some point say we wouldn't allow them to do that or? Uh, no, actually, and our, you know, our work on the policies around field trips really helped to strengthen, you know, good standing around that. I just wanted to have the discussion because it's, it, it is a, um, there's a, an impact on our community. Uh, this company has changed their you know, philosophy a little bit. They never used to have scholarships to assist people in need. They, they do not offer that, so there is an ability for assistance. You know, so these trips are quite expensive. They could be two or three or four thousand uh, dollars to spend a week. It's a faculty member, and um, they have a guide from the company that goes to help facilitate but that. It's typically not a school sponsored trip, it's because this is a for profit company that's coming in to do this, so. Like there are lots. There are lots of examples of for profit companies right, working. Right, but I mean, with we don't. This is not a school sponsored event. We don't have any real say in whether it happens or doesn't happen. The only thing we have say over is whether or not we allow them to advertise it in school. So that is the real. Uh, that's a great uh, discussion point. The trips we were taking most recently, um, which is maybe six or seven years ago now, were unquestionably private trips. They were not school sponsored trips. And we made a clear differentiation about it. And the policy actually has uh, field trips during the day, school sponsored trips that occur outside of the day, and trips that are uh, not affiliated with the school. And for those trips, they can't be advertised in the school. Meetings can be only held in the school in the same way that you know, youth basketball uses the school, but not you know, during the day. This company and this work would actually fit into school sponsored. There would be an, an advisor who worked here who would be working with the company and our students. And there is a way to do that. It is a perfectly legitimized way within the policy to do that. That's really why I wanted to talk to you about it. And what I can do is I can actually send you the policy and we can have a follow-up discussion at the next meeting. Because the concern was always, what is our liability? We are sending students abroad. That if, if we were to bring the students to Five Rivers, we would supervise them every minute and we would know where they were and we'd have accountability and we'd be checking in. If we're sending them to Germany, I would want to know there were the same levels of checks and balances. I would never want to send a child into a place, my, ch my own children or anyone else's, where they, they could be placed uh, in, in jeopardy. So uh, I think it is a good idea for me to send along the policy that has those three caveats because we would be exercising something we haven't done in a long time. We were doing private ones outside of school before. Um, and I think there is some strength, as I said, to us uh, legitimizing it and um, making sure that it, we follow due diligence in, in how we're uh, allowing um, these trips to occur. But it, like I said, I think um, those of us who have worked in other school districts, we've had experience with students attending these trips. And it, it really it broadens their, their mind in a way that, unfortunately, all the talking as a parent and all the experience in the classroom just uh, doesn't always do. So I'll share that with you and we can um, have a follow-up discussion at the next meeting. Um, so I promised you we would have a discussion about budget development um, because we've done budget development in a few different ways. We've done instructional presentations followed by the financial impact and what that looks like as far as budget development. We did a budget advisory committee last year. They did five meetings, had the presentations at those meetings. The board got a summary. Uh, and then um, we moved forward with budget uh, approval. And um, I think John's presentation fits in perfectly with this discussion. We need to have a long range planning committee to uh, investigate or invest in our um, programmatic priorities. 
Um, I think we have a sense of what they are in the district, but our programmatic priorities are financial standing, uh, excuse me, pro uh, <laughs> our uh, programmatic priorities are facilities needs, which is what John and, and we were just talking about, and our financial standing. I think a long range planning committee can finally put those pieces together. If we're talking about CTE, that is, that's all about program. It has to be married to facilities and, and finances. So uh, a long range planning committee that's looking five years down the road, and we just talked about um, the roll off of our debt, which is really 23, 24, 25. If you're not planning five years down the road, you get caught because the planning for five years from now is right now. So um, we are going to form a, a, a long-range planning committee. It will have community members on it, um, staff and, uh, and board members, um, to really look at the big picture items. And from that, we will probably have our construction committee you know, be birthed, because uh, um, thinking uh, large scope is different than uh, managing and monitoring the daily progress of construction projects. So, um, but I will be sending something out uh, about what that would look like conceptually, um, how often we'd meet and um, how we would accomplish that. But So what I want to ask about budget development is, what is it the board wants to have, wants to see this year? Are you more interested in the nuts and bolts of um, work that's accomplished in the buildings and we say, we know we really need uh, an extra science teacher because we've, we've got expansive science electives now and it's our priority to continue to expand so we build program around that without a presentation but just here's the FTE this is the cost of hiring somebody um, how much detail are you interested in, in having how many over successive meetings I have uh, you know Sue did a mock-up of like the schedule you know the traditional schedule that we have the calendar of all the events that that we do over the budget season um, what is it you think you most want to see or experience or, or uh, hear about in order to be informed? Honestly, if, if we talk about, I just brought it up, is that if we, if we talk about that, how do we measure the success of that use of those funds for that kind of thing? That's ultimately so that we have something in the future to say this is what we did this for, this is where we got with the money that we spent. Perfect, okay. So uh, discussing what we've done in 1920, 2021, the measurement of whether it was effective. Okay, yep. great. We need to know if it was successful and the money we're spending. Correct. You know, on the programs in the past couple of years and then how we're going to spend money, I think, in future years. And how we measure the success of that in the future years. Correct. Yeah. Tina would be proud of us having this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That's, that is a good foundation to know uh, as we're continuing investment. In other words, do we change horses or do we uh, choose something, um, add to it? I, yep, okay, we can do that. And we can go right from the things that we did through our budget advisory last right. year. Uh, what else? I think what some of our needs are going to be. Uh, I mean, we have other presentations, not just from, you know, administration or buildings, but from facilities, from transportation and you know, other departments mm -hmm. of, you know, what are our needs? Do we need two buses? Do we need, you know, new doors? Do we need two new teachers? You, you know, what those needs are. I, I, I like that Jason said CNI as well because the board has seated committees that are very valuable in this process and they're looking at program all the time. So, yeah. And often the, the ones around transportation and food service are some of our easier presentations. You know, they're pretty straightforward. Correct. Well, we need to see it. Right? So if nothing's changing and it's kind of status quo and we're just trying to maintain where we were so if it's no O and M. We're not going to change nothing in that, but we are looking at buses, and we just talk about that. If it's food service, and we're trying to maintain what we had last year, we just we don't need to see that. It just you know, you can put it in one slide, just saying we're going to maintain where we were last year, right? Or a couple little bullets about what we may want to or may need to incorporate. Mm -hmm. Other than that, it does need to be a presentation. Okay. All right, anything else? No. 
come up with any other ideas, then you know, send them to Dr. Bailey and we can put them on the you know, budget calendar, budget review of what we should include. So based on that, Sue and I will, will work on this list a little bit and, and flesh it out a little bit better and then share it with you. We, we should have something to share with you next time and then uh, we can discuss it more. Um, this is American Education Week, which basically was canceled last year. Basically everything was canceled last year because we were all on fire. Um, and uh, this year, it's even though it's November, it's, it's early. So today we, we uh, spent some time acknowledging the work of our paraprofessionals. That's all the people who do the support here, our bus drivers, uh, nurses, TAs, BAs, food service, um, and the fact that our doors can't be open um, without uh, their work. Tomorrow, um, we'll acknowledge the work of our instructional staff and um, the fact that they, they, like the Energizer Bunny, they just keep going in spite of name a thing um, being piled on top of them and um, they continue to do work on behalf of the children of the district. So um, I, uh, it should be American Education Year uh, at this point uh, because it's a tough business to be in we all know that um, so we're very grateful to the the people that continue to do the work and, and keep us open and do, do the right things on behalf of our kids um, and I'll share uh, we've got one article up I'll share the other article when we put it to it's got pictures of, of a bunch of our staff and some nice anecdotes about them um, the music department wants their auditorium back um, this has been great I mean, we're on the stage. I mean, this is everyone's music. But uh, the music department is turning the corner, uh, definitely already in the concert season, but we'll be into theater season coming up. Um, so they're begging us to move back into the library um, to hold our meetings. We talked about it a month and a half ago, and we decided we would stay here for now. But we're, we're getting to the crucial uh, time when, uh, when they need to use this space set up and break down and then once we get into the theater they won't be able to break stuff down because it'll be big in here um, the um, the limitations would be we, we just got new furniture in there and we've got to take a whole bunch of stuff out so um, there won't be at, you know 750 seats but there'll probably be um, 40 to 60 seats in there and um, the one thing that I was most concerned about um, as we have hearings and petitions is that people who want to give voice have an opportunity to do that. So what I was going to recommend is that when we advertise our board meetings that we talk about hearings and petitions, we again highlight Sue's um, in receiving hearings and petitions and that if there's somebody who has a hearing and petition that she's conscientious about ensuring that one of those 40 to 60 seats belongs to that person because the board has hearings and petitions so you can hear those voices, but um, I just I wanted to know if you had any thoughts about that. I would never come back to the auditorium. You don't I think like it's that awful. Event. This is lousy for a meeting. The acoustics are terrible. I can't hear half the time. I'm looking at two people and there's, I, no, I, uh, this is just a terrible setup. I would prefer to stay in the, the library and if it gets, you know, if it's too crowded or we're too close together, then I don't know. We're back to virtual, but this this doesn't work for me. So, yeah, it is tough. It's not very personal, right? No, it's terrible. It's terribly impersonal. Even when somebody speaks, I'm Mr. Sharkey speaking. I can't see him. I can barely hear him because the speaker's over there. I feel weird because I'm trying to look down to follow, but it's just very awkward. It's awful. Yeah. <clears throat> Hmm? I'm offended. You're offended? Yes. Because <laughs> oh. we're on the, you have to look it up the whole time, and apparently that's horrible. <laughs> Good thing I can't that's hear you, so right. I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually a mom that said it. <laughs> been looking at you for so many years, you shouldn't be offended. <laughs> so, thank you. The last thing I wanted to say is that um, uh, we've, uh, we've had a, uh, I think we're at about 49 positive cases in the district to date. Um, it represents um, potentially uh, with students in quarantine um, over 3,000 missed uh, opportunities to learn. And we've continued to adapt each time that we've had quarantines. And this, in this re most recent instance, we've had a couple classes, which thankfully it's only other happened one other time so far this year where a couple classes go out in one of our buildings. And um, we, depending on the age, sometimes they're getting um, 
uh, sometimes the student, the teacher may allow the, the student to view the class, in other words, like we did last year. Um, or sometimes the teacher, um, we have a substitute come in at subs for the teacher, or the substitute themselves does like a lesson with the, the kids um, for 20, 30, 40 minutes. So they're actually teaching them while they're at home. Um, and we just added another thing where uh, staff um, who volunteer can do additional time with our students, 15 or 20 minute check-ins with them. But it really depends on the grade level. And I will say we're kind of evolving. We've gotten better as this has gone along. And, and maybe Mr. Engelhart can add more. But one thing that we're clear on is that a parent who is accustomed to a child being in school for six hours a day, or five hours a day, or seven hours a day, <clears throat> they, um, they really are, are, are rationally, are rationally concerned that their child isn't getting the same education. So um, we, like I said, we're continuing to work on how we best de uh, deliver instruction to our kids who are in quarantine. And um, we're very optimistic about what's going on in other counties where they're allowing testing to return in quarantine and they're also uh, considering ways for uh, symptomatic students to be back sooner. Um, that's got to help too uh, because we're already trying to make up for last year and, and this obviously is, is not helping at all. I don't know if you have anything to add. Um, but, um, Bill, I have a quick yeah. Um, is, is quarantining different for students that are vaccinated than students that aren't vaccinated? It is. Unless you're symptomatic, if you're vaccinated, you need not quarantine. So there is a benefit to those individuals that are, are vaccinated. And for a lot of reasons, not everybody is. So um, the uh, Department of Health asks that they monitor their health for 14 days after the exposure, but they can continue on with business as usual. They also recommend that they wear a mask in all settings, even while at home, just in case. Okay. I just wanted to be sure to make sure that, you know, students that are vaccinated aren't having this issue with missing as much school. No, that's a good point as well. We just sent out a request in my Friday letter last week for families whose children are vaccinated. If they'd be willing to share that with the school nurse, it helps expedite our tracing processes. Right now, we'll take 52 children at, at, uh, in one of our buildings. That's a lot of contact tracing. None of them were age eligible, so it wasn't as difficult in that. But if it were a middle school or high school class where the students are age eligible, the nurse has to go in and specifically check each individual in our in the data state database system. If we had a, a vaccination card or, or a Excelsior pass from from children who have already had it, they would just know that Billy Smith doesn't need to go into quarantine and then it's they don't get caught up in the process so we just ask parent families for that and i think they're trickling in a few at the secondary level have come should in. that be something a parent does after the first vaccination or the second the second one they need to be fully vaccinated awesome i have one more question yeah i know that we talked before about um if a student has symptoms being able to test them at school and i think they were trying that yeah. in saratoga county is there any update on Something like that? The thing that has held us back is we, and you saw on our agenda tonight, we've hired uh, one additional staff member to help with that process. So we're hoping that after Thanksgiving, we'll be able to start. And it's kind of a mixed uh, mixed metaphor there. Saratoga is, is offering testing for students who are in quarantine and are not sick. That's what they're testing right now. But what I discussed with the group was, we are interested in implementing um, diagnostic testing here, which is a cheek swab goes out to Syracuse and is tested within 24 to 30 hours. So in other words, um, I go home, I'm sick, or more my child does. One of our students goes home sick before they leave, or if they're home, they can come in, they get their cheek swabbed in 24 hours, they know that they don't have COVID. As soon as they're well, they can come back. Right now, the protocol is by the Department of Health, they need to stay out for 10 days or get tested somewhere else, which is a pain. We've all had to go through that make an appointment, wait in line, pay the price, and then wait for the results, which could be three to five days, and you're already at 10 days by the time that happens. So if we're able to test here and make it a 20, 24 to 30 hour turnaround, that's what we're trying to do um, to- uh, So we actually physically own the tests to do this. Albany County has we, provided them for us, yes. But we just don't have the person to do it. Not yet, but we're close, we're close. Uh, and there's some training involved too, but we're, we're gonna get there. We did ask families who are interested to register um, register their children because you got to go in and log in and do that. But that'll help as well. 
So, um, but once I think we're going, once we get moving, people unquestionably will sign up because they don't want their child to sit at home because they had a cough one day. They're going to want them to come back. Because I, I do remember signing up a long yeah. time ago and have had to deal with many yep, we, COVID tests. Early October, early to the second week of October, we did that. You're exactly right. Is this all a process or protocol that the Albany County Department of Health puts in place and then we just follow that? Or they have to approve it? They, uh, we already have approval to be a testing site under their license, um, and we're left to develop the process on our own. Other co uh, counties have been a little bit more, uh, have been able to help more. Other counties have, the Green County's got a van, they drive around and they test, they'll test anybody. You can be from Albany County or uh, Schoharie County, go to Green County to their mobile van, get tested and the results come back really quickly. That's not what Albany County did. They're, they're relying on us to figure out a plan of how we're gonna do it. And every school's been different, everyone we've looked at. Okay. Dr. Lee, if a parent wants to keep a child home because they aren't feeling well or whatever, they just call school, tell them that they're keeping them home because uh, they are not feeling well or they're symptom, like how does that, and then does that trigger the whole uh, like are they back like how does that work they would do as they ordinarily would if the child were going to be absent they would call in and they would talk to the office or the school nurse if it's a covid related symptom that 10-day protocol comes into play and you know if we're completely honest it, unquestionably families they're they're missing work they're missing time with their, their children they're missing all kinds of things when their children are home um, we we encourage people to be truthful they need to be because when someone is not and a positive case comes to school, then it you know can take out a whole class. Um, we we want people to be truthful in it. So if they call in, if it's you know they've got a broken ankle, that is not a COVID related thing. That wouldn't be an issue of them coming back. But if they said um, I have a fever and I'm sick to my stomach, that's clearly that's part of the 10-day protocol. But they can also they can test and they can come back sooner as long as they're well. That's the the magic of the testing right now. Um, I do think things are changing on the horizon. I think that we're going to see some changes because there's so many counties that are experimenting with a lot of different variables to see how close, just like we, when we opened school this year, we had 15 different protocols we were using every day. We're down to four, really, you know, social distancing, um, mask wearing, hand sanitizing and washing and, um, and, and uh, testing and sick protocols. The, the county uh, health departments are starting to experiment to see how close they can get without increasing numbers. You know, I mean, what can they, what else can they reduce? And, and, uh, and it's good, they're, they're being scientific about it and they're going slow, but we're gonna benefit from it. Saratoga does this thing and they get kids back sooner. Albany County will be forced to accept, you know, that that's a reasonable way to get our kids back into classrooms where they need to be. So that's the hope. Let them be successful, and then we follow that model. Albany County is a little bit behind. They're they're very conservative in their approach, um, but they're transparent about their conservancy. I mean, we have meetings uh, every other week. All of us, all the superintendents, meet with uh, Dr. Whelan every other week, and we ask her hard questions, and she gives us hard answers, and we we move on. Okay. Thanks. Anything else? We'll turn it over to Mr. Engelhart. So I do. Can you? Hear me okay i did blow my voice out at the football game so congratulations to them again and our coaching staff um i i wanted to reiterate just the celebration at our schools around our school gardens it's something that's been on our agenda for the last couple of years um, this past week peter b uh, put in a, a, several beds um, in our PBL coach or project-based learning coach is actively working with the staff on how to integrate that into curriculum. So we're excited to see what the spring holds, but that kind of Peter B was our last school to really have that resource. So I wanted to celebrate the work that they're doing there. Um, I think I had mentioned that we have partnered with St. Peter's um, and uh, there's a, a project they're leading called Feeding a Healthy Future and it's really about health and safety around our students and we're looking at ways to keep, get kids active. So we have had conversations, I just wanna let the board know, around the possibility of increasing some of like the wilderness trails or the trails around the schools. It's an investigatory type of processes right now, but we wanna to look to see if there's ways to do that um, around our buildings to get kids outside more. 
Uh, there's a lot of research around the health benefits to getting kids outside. Um, and so doing things like even snowshoeing during winter times, which they already do, but expanding what we do is something that we're really interested in looking into. So we're excited to work with them around that as well. Um, <clears throat> the middle school and high school furniture for the libraries, um, their, their library spaces, so the career cafe at the high school, and then our middle school, they're getting furniture in. We're excited to, to celebrate that. Um, and hopefully we can share some pictures soon. They're still setting some of that space up, but those spaces will have some sort of maker space or seminar space, study space, and we're really excited um, that we've kind of reimagined it and it's coming to fruition. So we're excited about that as well. Um, I had mentioned last board meeting around the middle school social studies department um, collecting candy for first responders and for um, uh, our military services. I just wanted to let folks know they collected over 250 pounds of candy. <laughs> yep, so, you know, less cavities, I guess, for, for those children. Um, but I guess Mr. Wamsley's uh, seventh, eighth band, Mrs. Ladder's first period class, Ms. Snyder's first period class, and Ms. Shafferdine's first period class were the big winners in that. So. Um, lots of candy brought in for that. I also mentioned last time, and we've had the flag retirement event um, uh, that was facilitated by Ms. Sawyer and Ms. Veronda Schmidt, um, really just to highlight civic responsibility for our kids. So that occurred, and I think that was something that might be built, built upon. Our social studies department created lessons around that um, just to encourage civic responsibility and patriotism. So we're really excited about that. Middle school also wanted to celebrate their physical education student of the month, so please check out the website around those students who have positive attitudes, team membership, par uh, participation. And then I know on old business, and we can keep it on old business, but I wanted to just give an update. Um, uh, we are regularly looking for, um, uh, not regularly looking for, we are proactively getting certified in work-based learning. We have to have it registered through New York State. So we did just get back from New York State approval for our general education work experience program and our work experience and career exploration program. So we're really excited about that. We sh we'll be able to give students credits for their work ex experience and for um, that internship. And the last thing I just wanna mention is you, uh, many folks here know that we have um, a volunteer group, the STARS Intergen. Um, some of our family members are, are part of that. And um, this past, last week, um, they celebrated um, uh, Miss Nancy Bruno's 90th birthday, but also her 20th year um, in working at Peter B with Miss Crown. So um, we, they had a little celebration for her and we just wanna thank her for, for her service with that and celebrate the STARS because they're a huge resource for for us and for our kids. And I think that's it. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Moran. Yep, a quick update. Um, part of John Sharkey or Mr. Sharkey's um, presentation today, I just wanna reiterate that there'll be more information coming on a capital project, we don't know what we're gonna call it yet, committee that we'll be seeking, um, that we'll pursue. But in addition to that, we're also gonna be, and we are working on our five-year facilities plan. We'll be doing work on that, and we'll come up with a way that we can use that five years facility plan as we do budget development, we do capital um, project planning, um, and the smaller project, the capital outlay project. So there'll be a lot going on. I'm working with the facilities director right now, Mr. Schramm and Mr. Symington. We'll be doing a lot of the legwork for that as we establish a, a plan so we know where our needs are. To your point, Mr. Reveille, what's an immediate need, what's a, a future need and we'll be able to put that that's what that plan will look like it takes a little bit of work um, there was an email that was sent out to all staff today because one of the things that we know we talk about every time we meet is a bus driver shortage it's still a problem um, we're going to offer up an rcs staff ride and drive event where if somebody who is a, one of our employees wants to know what it's like to drive a big yellow bus They'll have an opportunity on December 7th. The requirement is they have to have a New York State valid driver's license and they can ride a bus to see if it's something that they'd like to pursue. RCS does offer paid training to become a bus driver. And again, this would allow our staff members, either anybody that may be working part-time that wants a career change and can drive a bus or somebody that's looking to learn how to drive a bus and drive after their other duties. 
Uh, I don't want to deter um, any community members. We are going to be doing one open for the community members this spring. Um, December 7th would be weather permitting. But this spring we'll be offering it up to our families and our community. But uh, that doesn't mean we wouldn't let somebody in the community that wants to see if they can drive a bus, they can reach out to the transportation department and they can schedule a time where they can try to do it. I did it, I drove a 66 passenger bus, I drove it around the parking lot, I backed it up, I parallel parked it, not that bad. It was, it was great actually, it's easy to do. Um, and again, that's all I have right now as we start in, to embark on the budget process. Uh, does anybody have any new business? Anything new on any of these old business items that you'd like to discuss? Go ahead. <coughs> we last week we discussed the transition coordinator. There wasn't any. It's um, the second bullet on old business. Okay. Um, uh, if, if it's okay, if we just take that off, uh, we we um, had uh, Miss Reinish on our agenda today. She's going to take that position. We're excited about that work. Okay. Is that okay? All right, thank you. Yep. We've no BOE committee reports, no policy adoption review, hearing some petitions. So we just wanna make some comments. Uh, all comments should be addressed to the board from the podium or the microphone set up. Please limit your question or statement to three minutes so as to ensure sufficient time for all present to have an opportunity to speak. Any topics which fall properly under executive session will not be discussed in public session. Please limit your comments to three minutes. Uh, we do have a buzzer that Mrs. Starr will um, start for three minutes. So please, uh, everyone that comes up, uh, try to finish in the three minutes. And once you, uh, you hear the buzzer, uh, please stop. And we'll give you a warning um, before shutting off the microphone. Uh, the first speaker is Jessica O'Connor. Hello, my name is Jessica O'Connor and I have two children in the RCS school district. It has come to our attention as a community that we are not okay with the support of fair teacher salaries. I'm here to explain to you that we are in fact supportive of fair, competitive and well-deserved salary raises. Here are just a few of the reasons why your RCS teachers have chose to enter the field of education. Quote, as a child, I experienced a lot of trauma. School was an outlet for me and I stayed after school to participate in as many clubs and sports as I could, making amazing connections with teachers and coaches. Their support and genuine care for what I went through and time they spent giving me advice meant so much to me. I knew I wanted to be that influence for students someday. If it weren't for those teachers, I don't know where I would be today. So really, the career chose me. To quote a second teacher, what motivated me and still motivates me today, 20 plus years later, is my experience with the teacher slash artist at an art school where I had such a positive experience it helped raise my self sense of self-esteem. This was the point which I knew I wanted to be a teacher so that I could give that experience an opportunity to others to find the creative part within each of them. It is important for all of my students, but especially important for the portion of children who, like myself, may have a lack of self-esteem. I want them to love learning, and that is why I love teaching. A third teacher says, I basically became a teacher because as a child, I attended a fantastic elementary school. I was always a teacher's pet, organizing things for them and cutting things out for the bulletin board. I studied everything they did. I originally went to school to become a geologist because I loved earth science. But after about a year, I got sick of studying rocks. <laughs> and I thought about what I loved most about my childhood, School was one of those things. So I started my elementary education program immediately, and I've been here for 28 years and the rest is history. These teachers clearly are here to invest in the future of our children, and it is now your turn to help us invest in the future of our teachers. My only hope is that you could see the teachers through my eyes, not through the eyes of an employer or an accountant, but through the eyes of a parent. Maybe then you will see that these teachers are irreplaceable and should be valued. Teachers, I want to say thank you. Thank you for showing up every single day for the children of this community. We are indebted to you. Thank you. Andrea 
Suloff. Andrea, yep, sorry. Good evening, my name is Andrea Saloff. I am a district parent and have two children in Peter B. Elementary School. Tonight, I'm going to read you an excerpt from A Day in the Life of a Teacher by Amber Guerrero. Me, okay class today, student, this is stupid. I'd rather be playing video games. Voicemail, my kid told me that you, email, we need you to sub on this prep. Teacher coaches, students are experiencing an all-time level of trauma. Form relationships with all students and make connections every day. SRSS, make sure to incorporate ELA and math into your lesson plan daily so we can boost our scores for data. IEP, implement these modifications and accommodations for these students every hour, document it. 504, you are legally bound to adhere to these accommodations for students, document it. Student services, you have four homeless students. You'll need to provide the following daily. Student medical alert. These students will die if you don't monitor these medical issues closely. Professional development. We're trying something new this year, even though we're not ready to roll it out, and there's no funding for it. Be sure to document what you're doing it, that you're doing it correctly. Media. Your classroom is going to get shot up any minute. Surprise observation. Be, these, be sure these goals are set, reports are finished, lesson plans are perfect, and that you hit the learning target and success criteria multiple times. We need documentation and evidence that you're doing this. Standardized test, you suck as a teacher. Also, <laughs> your rating is based on this, but also make sure students don't feel defined by their performance on these. PBIS, teach students the expectations in the hallway, cafeteria, classroom, and outside. Be sure to only reward positive behavior. Check in and check out with these specific students daily. MTSS, we have three tiers of support. What about your gifted students, pull-out students, intervention students? Why aren't you providing enough differentiation? You're going to need to provide documentation for this. Door, keep me locked so that students are safe. Yes, you will be interrupted to open me 10 times an hour. Lesson plans, are they aligned with school, state, US, and worldwide standards? Be sure to document that. Tech department, we are working on correcting today's issue as quickly as we can. Department heads, I've been told we need to align all of our curriculum, assessments, daily lesson plans. Be sure to document that. Staff memo, be sure to attend the following meetings this week. Staff, grade level, course subject, tech, school climate, and school improvement. Social worker, yes, I filed that CPS report and the other one. Now we wait for the state to act. Student, my stepdad got arrested last night for beating up my mom. Fire drill, surprise, make sure all the students are safe. Now, go back to teaching. External threat drill, surprise, make sure your students are silent and out of the funnel of potential bullet spray. Now, go back to teaching. Administrators, literally being pulled in 20 directions at once, every day, while fielding discipline, making multiple teacher observations, fielding staff, breaking up fights, keeping us safe, performing investigations, cooperating with police, meeting with students and parents, and attending all after school and extracurricular activities. State, make sure you are highly qualified, but you must pay for all your professional development, student loans, grad classes, conferences, hotel Please state, finish up. Food, travel, substitute teachers, and out-of-pocket, and you need to update your certification. You need to pay for that, too. Bladder, you haven't peed in seven hours, you're going to get another infection. Parent of a student, you make a difference. Student, I know I am special and I have value because of you. I had a chance to read about half of what our teachers do daily, and they do it for $10,000 less than the teacher does 10 miles down the road. I implore you to invest in our teachers and raise their wages. Thank you. Melanie Potter. As an RCS graduate myself and a parent in the district for the past 13 years, there are so many good things that I could say about every teacher in this room and in the entire district. But I was asked to just think of one teacher. So I'm going to very briefly speak of just one math teacher at the high school who has made an impact not only on my children, but on me as a parent and on our community as a whole. This teacher has had both of my two older children over a span of three years, before, during, and coming through COVID. 
Not only is she an amazing teacher who thinks very differently about grading and presenting her lessons, but she also cares about her kids deeply and wants to make sure she doesn't just get through a lesson, but that each child understands to their own fullest capacity. She does videos to help her fellow teachers teach different concepts and does them for parents. Throughout the time of remote instruction, she was who I turned to, not only for math help, but for technology help in general. She problem shot all kinds of different issues for me, for my children, for other students, and I happen to know she also does the same for her coworkers. She also goes above and beyond in her communication with parents on grades, on student concerns, and on praises. She called me just last week to tell me a positive report on one of my children, even admitting when he bested her on a math problem. And this is a high school teacher. She goes above and beyond the classroom as well. As a very active class advisor who is super creative in her fundraising ideas, and she makes sure to involve parents there as well. She even came to the football game last week with her small children and messaged parents to make sure she knew who, what kids' numbers were so she could cheer for them. I could go on and on, not only about this teacher, but so many others. Thanks for hearing us and how desperate we, we want and need to keep quality teachers like this one in our district. Thank you. Thank you. Jackie Kelney. Good evening. Um, my name is Jackie Kelney. I have two boys at Peter B. Oops, sorry, I'm a little short. Um, and I'm here in support of the teacher salary increases. They say it takes a village to raise a child. I don't think that I ever really appreciated that phrase before my kids entered elementary school. These people behind me are my kids' village. I'm sorry. <laughs> These are the people they spend five days a week with. The impact that they have goes far beyond math and ELA. They are helping us to raise our kids. At the beginning of the school year, my son had a rough transition back to the classroom, as many kids did. He had trouble with another kid at recess for a few days, and it was tough to get him to even go to school. I hope anyone behind me in the drop-off line enjoyed the spectacle of me tearing a 100-pound kid out of my car, or when I would storm off with him going back to the house because I couldn't fight him another day. If it weren't for the teachers and staff at the school, I'm not sure we would have survived the transition. They were in it with us until it got better. They provided support and reassurance, not just to my kid, but to me too. This goes beyond his regular teachers. One of the aides at drop-off kindly helped to get him into school when I had to pry him out of the car with significantly more patience than I had left at the time. I heard from multiple people, from other teachers, from TAs, from the secretaries, who would check in with him when they saw him upset in the hallway and would check in with me to tell me he was okay. And not for one second did I worry about him once he got inside, because I knew he was in a building full of people who care so much about him and the other kids in that school. Our kids are why these people are still here. This is why they haven't moved on to a higher paying district yet, because they want to stay with RCS. They want to be a part of our kids' village, and we as parents want them here too. I love our district because of the people who are right there with my kids, day in and day out. So I am begging you to protect my kids' village by fixing the salary issue in this district. And to you teachers who are here tonight, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. And if you need some extra pencils, tissues, markers, or pretty much anything else, they're in the trunk of my car, right outside. <laughs> Please come see me after this meeting because I don't want to take it all home. But if you don't take it from me tonight, I'll drop it off to all four schools in the morning. I apologize, I didn't get the list of backordered supplies early enough to get some of those particular items with me tonight. But if you're still missing anything at all, please do not hesitate to call me, email me, and we will get it fixed for you. Thank you. Thank you. Joy Ayafello. Hopefully I said it right. I am follow. Sorry. Sorry, I didn't.
didn't prepare anything, but um, I just felt as a taxpayer I should come in support of the um, teachers. I, uh, you know, have voted yes for the uh, school budget ever since I owned a property, and I think I bought my first property at 25. So anyway, that was way before I had kids. But as a parent, um, Miss Laughlin was one of the first people brought to my attention who is the PE teacher at A.W. Becker. I have two kids at A.W. Becker. And um, she announced her leaving on Facebook. I had to tell my child because we ran into her in, within our community like a week before. My children cried. Then I had to hear her um, speak, Miss L. And when she said it, that she um, was leaving, it was over $15,000. And um, if that amount wasn't bad enough, then she called it life-changing money, which made me want to drive to her house and give her $15,000, because, I mean, she has been here. She stu was a student. Her mentors were our previous physical education teachers. She told stories of how they inspired her. Then she was here, and we had made plans. I am also um, the president of the A.W. Becker PTA. On field day, we spoke of these things and our plans for next year and, you know, getting the kids more active, and she's just awesome. And that's just one, again, just one example. So as a taxpayer, as a parent, as the um, president of the PTA, I just felt that it was important to come and voice my opinion as everybody else. And, um, oh, the PTA, the PTO, and the PTSO were not listed at all on the district website. So people don't know like who the players are in any of those, which is hugely important. Um, I can't remember the numbers, but I've been involved with the PTA for probably, what, five years now? And every year, it's about $10,000 of things that we fund. I mean, obviously not field trips right now, but um, other things that we've done, switched gears just to give back and help out people in the community, the teachers, just everybody. And uh, it's too important not to be even mentioned on the district website. So uh, I think that was it. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Milano. Milano, sorry. Milano. Butchering some names tonight. I apologize. Good evening. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak this evening. My name is Jenny Molino, and I have a daughter in sixth grade and a son in second grade at Becker. Both my children have had the privilege to have absolutely amazing educators who have met their academic and social needs, who have gone above and beyond to make sure that my children have everything they need to succeed. In an effort to support the amazing educators my children have had, I am an active participant in the Becker PTA and the middle school PTSO. I am also a preschool special education teacher. So I know firsthand how much time, effort, and energy goes into the education of young minds. I know how much of themselves teachers pour into their students, how much of their personal time is dedicated to their students, how much of their own money goes into their classroom to make it a home away from home where their students feel welcomed and loved. I know that teachers spend time while with their own families worried about their students, thinking things such as, am I doing enough for my students? How am I going to reach all of my students? How will I make sure that I am giving my students the very best that I possibly can? I recently read a quote from an educational activist, Nic Nicholas Ferroni, on Facebook that captures the true essence of teachers. Educators are the only people who lose sleep over other people's children. That really hit home for me. As a parent, I know that I'm not alone in wanting what is best for my kids, wanting them to have more than I had at their age and be able to do more than I did at their age. I want children in general, and my children specifically, to be able to excel to the highest point possible. I am not naive enough to believe I can do this alone, that I alone can provide that for my children. I know that I need the help of others, most especially teachers, to help me fulfill that dream for my children. Don't we owe it to our children, our future, to give them the best possible education? Can we do that? When our district does not pay a competitive salary, can we afford to continue to lose skilled and seasoned educators to other districts who will offer them the compensation they deserve? 
Can we afford not to attract new educators who will provide the newest and best that education has to offer because the salary RCS offers does not meet their needs? Can we afford to let our children suffer due to staff shortages and low morale? Can we really be comfortable with continuously asking our teachers, the ones who we trust to love and educate our children, to do more for less? Can we be okay with allowing the teachers who provide so incredibly much for our children each and every day to feel unappreciated and to be grossly undercompensated? Our children need to be as prepared as possible for the competitive world they will enter when they graduate. For this to happen, we need to provide our children with the best education possible. For that to happen, we need to show our teachers their value with raises that allow them to see the direct relationship between our respect for their profession and the monetary compensation they receive for providing an excellent education for our children. Give our teachers the raises they so desperately deserve. Give our children the very best possible. The two go hand in hand. I thank you in advance for your careful and thoughtful consideration of this request. I'm excited to see the change that I know RCS is possible of making. The change that allows teachers to see their value to our students, to our school, and to our community. Thank you. Thank you. Chelsea Hildebrandt. Good evening. My name is Chelsea Hildebrandt. I'm a graduate of this district and a lifelong resident, as is my family. It will probably be no surprise my opinion of some of the administration in this district, but I am not here tonight to talk about that. I'm not here to talk about the lack of follow through and communication when a student gets ha harassed and threatened via a school issued computer or the lack of disciplinary action taken when an elementary student gets assaulted by a schoolmate. I am not here to talk about the inconsistencies and contradictions by our superintendent. And I'm also not here to talk about the fact that our children's school supplies took almost three months to reach their classrooms or the ridiculous excuse that they were sitting on the loading dock with no one to distribute them. I personally know many parents and staff sitting here tonight who would have volunteered to distribute these materials. I'm also not here to discuss the fact that we have an entire library that our kids cannot use. My son is lucky enough to have a teacher who realizes the importance of reading and walks his students to the village library twice a month. Please don't get me wrong. I know administration is bombarded daily with complaints that are way out of your control. Mandates that come from much higher than you. And I am in no way saying that your job is easy or that I could do it better. You couldn't pay me enough to do your job, although I hear that it's a handsome amount. I'm here tonight to talk about something you can control. A way for you to show the teachers and staff, your teachers and staff, that you hear them, you support them, and that you appreciate them. Because right now, I can guarantee you, they don't feel it. Your teachers and staff went above and beyond last year, shifting to an entirely new way of teaching, a new way of thinking. How can I keep these kids engaged and still give them the education they need and deserve, all without batting an eye? They did everything you asked of them and more. Transportation issues, teacher shortages, class cancellations, it may not seem like it, but these are all things you can, in fact, do something about. You have the ability to make RCS a desirable workplace, a district that new graduates want to begin their teaching careers at. Give these teachers the money they deserve, the money they earned. Make them excited to come to work and happy to be a part of a school district that believes in them and knows their worth. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Jennifer Furman. Good evening, my name is Jennifer Furman. I have been a lifelong resident of the RCS district. I wanna first say that I loved this school as a child and wanted nothing more for my children to attend it as well. I have a son who is in second grade at A.W. Becker and all the teachers he has had have been amazing. If you ask my son what teacher has been his favorite, he will say all of them. He even thinks his first or kindergarten teacher named her newborn son after him. I didn't have the heart to tell him it wasn't true. <laughs> um, 
So the reason I am here today is to talk about the lack of respect this administration has for our teachers. We lost a ton of teachers over the past two years and have been unable to fill those positions because the administration doesn't want to pay. If you compare teacher salaries to our neighboring schools, it is embarrassing to see how underpaid our teachers in this district are. Salaries are public information, and I find it bothersome that Dr. Bailey and other administrative staff are all in line salary-wise to other districts, but our teachers are not. Um, sorry, my bad. Um, you all sat here a couple board meetings ago and listened to a woman fight back tears, giving her resignation and saying that she couldn't work for jobs to survive anymore. She got a job offer and they were willing to pay her what she deserves. At the same board meeting, you listened to current teachers at this school speak about how they were short two teachers to teach Regents math and they had to combine classrooms. My heart hurts knowing that our teachers are so undervalued in this district by the administration. We have amazing teachers in this district and if we do not show appreciation and pay them what they deserve, we will see more putting in resignation letters and going to other districts. The role of educators is valuable and significant to a society. They are one of the main pillars of a progressive society. Teachers bear the weight and responsibility of teaching and apart from parents, they are the main source of knowledge. From the age of four, a child finds himself in the hands of a teacher. Teachers make our children strong enough to stand on their own two feet and face any challenge. A teacher is much more important than a doctor or engineer. It is the teacher who makes that doctor or engineer. It's a teacher who shapes the life of young children throughout their lives. I know I only get three minutes to speak, so I will end with this. First, I wanna thank all the teachers in this district for all that they do and continue to do for our children. I am not sure I could wake up every day and go to a job that does not value me like you all do. It shows just how much each student in this district truly means to you. It may be unappreciated by the administration, but it is not by the parents or children. Second and lastly, I have zero faith in this administration as it's been going on for months. I have listened to current and retired teachers speak at numerous board meetings begging you all for what they deserve and nobody up on that stage ever bats an eye. It all falls on deaf ears. You are not putting your teachers, children, parents, or community first, which should be your one and only priority. With that, I believe it's time for Dr. Ba Bailey to resign so, he can get, so we can get someone in here who values the teachers like the community does. Thank you. Thank you. Trinia Warner. I'm here to support the teacher's contract and negotiations right now. I'm a former school psychologist of the district and was on the teacher's contract well here. I'm currently in my 24th year as a school psychologist and worked for RCS for four and a half years until I switched jobs at the end of September for a higher salary. The salary I would have been making isn't a lot for a single mother of two kids, one who's in college. The place I'm at now pays $10,000 more on the same step that I was at at RCS. Last year, I had an intern who told me that Ravina is well known at the College of St. Rose for our low paying salary schedule and that everyone knows not to apply here. I think we can probably agree that for a job that requires extra education like a master's degree, that we who work in the schools are probably the most underpaid yet well educated professions out there. Here we tell kids that they need to go to college to make any kind of money Yet I know people who never went to college working in professions taught at BOCES who are making well over 100,000 per year. My youngest son is a middle schooler in the district and I hope that Ravina starts paying all their staff what they are worth so that he continues to receive a quality education and that staff who are hired don't see Ravina as a stepping stone to a higher paying job. Thank you. A couple of quick things I just want to mention after hearings and petitions and 
You know, we really appreciate everybody coming up here with hearings and petitions and listening to these things. I want to remind, you know, all the parents that are coming here, the nine board members that are all up here, we're all parents as well. You know, between the nine of us, we have over 20 kids that go to these sc schools and they're graduates. We all have these same amazing stories. We sit and talk to these teachers. I just sat in teacher negotiations for the first time with some of the best teachers in the area, no doubt. I don't argue that fact. Just remember, we're all volunteers. None of us beg to do this job. We're here because nobody else signed up to do it. We're working and hopefully in time, we will come to an agreement. So none of us, I think, argue with any of you. We agree, we do have great teachers. So I just wanna make sure that's known. So thank you all for coming and, you know, like I said, I think all of us can say some of the same great things about our teachers. Uh, thank you. So, uh, upcoming activities. We do have Thanksgiving recess coming up 1124 to 1126. Uh, we will be going back into executive session, but we will not be taking action. Uh, I need a motion to move to executive session. Mrs. Motion to go to executive Sorry. session. Well, yes. Mrs. Burns, Mrs. Klein, all in favor? I.